This is College Talk with Dean Aldemaro Romero, Jr., a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College. New York, New York, the city that never sleeps. But uh, today we're talking with someone who looks at the city from a different perspective uh, and a very complex perspective, if you allow me to say, to say that. His name is Ken, uh, Ken Guess. He is a native from New Jersey who obtained his bachelor's degree in East Asian Studies at Columbia University in New York, a master's in religious studies at the Union Theological Seminar, also in New York, and a master's and a doctorate in anthropology from the City University of New York. So, a New Yorker, academically speaking. Academically speaking. Uh, today, he is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology in the Weizmann School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College, City University of New York. Welcome to College Talk, Dr. Guest. Delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Probably one of the questions that the audience may be asking themselves right now is, well, you mentioned in his vita, anthropology, theology, uh, is, is, is Eastern studies, What's the connection between all these different subjects? <laughs> I guess I'm the connection. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's played out in a very interesting way, and I was working on my uh, uh, beginning to map out my PhD program and my dissertation, and I was taking a class on New York City and immigration uh, with uh, Professor Peter Kwong and Ida, S Ida Susser, both of the CUNY Graduate Center, and uh, they wanted us to do some field work. And... Um, Professor Kwong was starting to do some work with new immigrants from Fuzhou, Southeast China. And uh, I had actually done my undergraduate degree in East Asian studies and uh, spent eight months in Beijing my junior year learning Chinese. And uh, so I thought this would be an exciting opportunity to do some research in New York with Professor Kwong. And um, my interest is, is in religion. I come from a, um, well, my mother is the fourth generation of uh, United Methodist ministers in our mm -hmm. family, so I have avoided that. Um, but uh, I come from a family with deep roots in uh, religious traditions, and so that's been something of deep interest to me, both on a personal and professional level. So when I started in Chinatown, I uh, quickly began to see that the religious scene was very complicated and also very central to new immigrants' experience. Because in fact, probably m most people don't know this, among many people of Chinese origin, Christianity is one of the uh, religious uh, uh, affiliations that you can find a lot of them in. Absolutely. Uh, one of the first things, uh, one of the first obstacles I overcame was a stereotype that Chinese are not religious. Mm -hmm. And um, I went out and read, as any good social scientist would do, I read all the books I could find on New York's Chinatown and other Chinatowns, and um, there was... Uh, only one paragraph in one of the couple dozen books about New York's Chinatown that talked about religion. I found that very strange, having lived in Beijing and uh, visited churches and temples, even in the 1980s after the Cultural Revolution, it was still a very vibrant religious uh, scene. And so I uh, started walking around Chinatown and mapping the blocks, and I found over 60 Chinese religious communities within Lower Manhattan's Chinatown. Uh, many of them were Christian, but also Buddhist and Taoist. Do you think that they, the, the reason why the perception that people have about the religious practices among Chinese is due that they don't seem to be boxed into the typical organized religions as we know in the Western uh, Hemisphere, but rather more spiritual in nature? Yeah, I think there are a number of factors. Uh, one is certainly all of the stories that have been told about China since the 19, late 1940s uh, with the communist government takeover and an assumption people have that uh, religion has been wiped out. And so there's an, uh, some assumption that Chinese people coming here are not going to be religious. Um, but I think uh, the second point that you're alluding to is that uh, for many Chinese people, religious uh, e expression and experience is, is very complicated and doesn't fit a lot of our Western cultural con uh, categories. So um, I'll tell you a little story. I went into a, a little storefront in Chinatown one day as I was doing this mapping, and um, all I could see on the outside was the, the uh, store banner was yellow, and it had, had the name of uh, had temple in the name. It was just a smoky glass window, very dark inside, but it had a little religious altar. And I introduced myself, and uh, they 
let me take a look at the altar, and there was a Buddha in the middle, and a Bodhisattva Guan Yin right next to the Buddha, and then there were nine other statues that uh, didn't seem to come from Buddhist tradition to me. And so I asked the man who was in charge, uh, is this a Buddhist temple? And he said, yes. I said, oh, yes, because I can see the Buddha and, and Guan Yin, the Bodhisattva, but I'm curious about these other nine figures. Oh, well, they're He Shen Jun, he said to me. They're the local god from my village. Uh, and I talked to He Shen Jun, and uh, He Shen Jun gives me visions and helps me interpret dreams for all of my parishioners. And I said, well, that sounds very Taoist. And he said, well, it is. And I said, so it's a Taoist temple. He said, why, yes. And I said, but a minute ago you said it was a Buddhist <laughs> temple. And he said, yes. And I said, so it is a Buddhist temple or a Taoist temple? And he said, yes. <laughs> but that's part of the experience I've had in China is you, yeah. when you go to a temple, there are yeah. uh, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, you know, uh, places for veneration and Taoist yeah. gods being worshipped and uh, ancestors and not quite the same uh, clear category of lines that we might expect. And the way you describe it almost sounds like pagan because they have like different gods for different things in a way. Sure, well, but pagan is almost a stereotypical term, right? Yeah. Uh, that is, doesn't meet our standards of what's normative to make it a real religion. So yeah. uh, in anthropology, we would call it a popular religious tradition, yeah. uh, something that, that emerges out of the local tradition and um, uh, out of the local community and is a, an expression of their experience of divinity, spirituality, uh, the divine, yeah. Sure. Okay, so you just mentioned anthropology. Mm. Now, when you mention that term, for a lot of people, anthropology are people who excavate mummies or measure skeletons, things like that. But there is an entirely other branch of anthropology called social anthropology mm -hmm. that probably people are less familiar with. What does a social anthropology do? Uh, uh, so people can get a better sense of what is your work, daily work. Sure. Um, well, this is, of course, one of the questions uh, that my students have in my Intro to Cultural Anthropology class every semester. What is anthropology? Is it about dinosaurs or rocks or yeah. stars? Or, uh, but, and their image of an anthropologist is maybe Indiana Jones. Exactly. Um, Which was actually an archaeologist. More and, and he's an archaeologist, but we, we <laughs> have archaeologists. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but anthropology in general is the study of humans. Yes. So we're interested in humans throughout time and uh, across all spaces. So it does include the archaeology of human settlements, um, also the physical anthropology of our evolutionary development. Uh, linguistically, we study language. And cultural anthropologists are interested in seeing how do humans live together in communities. And by our imagination is that by looking at the incredible diversity of ways that humans have lived, learned to live together, that we can um, that we can free ourselves from our limited imaginations of what life can be like. We grow up with a certain set of ideas about how we we can live, what we should believe, who we should, we should talk to, marry, work with, what kind of jobs we should have, but. By going outside of our culture and seeing how other people have uh, learned to live in groups and answer all those questions in different ways, we begin to see the grand scheme of opportunities that humans can have. And that hopefully um, helps us see our own culture in new ways, but also reimagine what's possible. And I don't think that uh, a lot of people realize that cult cultural anthropology is a branch that is actually employed in many other professions to understand the market, for example, sure. advertising, uh, communications, and a, a, a bunch of different things. So do you think that a lot of people who work on those different areas have enough of cultural anthropology uh, training mm -hmm. to really understand those issues? Well, I think you're, this is a really important question, and, and certainly it's one of the questions my students here at Baruch ask, uh, since many of them will uh, are aiming to be business majors, why an anthropology course is in their general education curriculum. And I, I explained to them that I think that anthropology may be the most important class they take in college, uh, because it's about learning how to navigate groups of people, how to understand new groups that you've never in be been in before, uh, and how to engage in a much deeper and uh, more compelling way with those groups. So um, yes, we find anthropologists uh, working in business, uh, doing marketing. Uh, we find anthropologists working for pharmaceutical co companies, thinking about how to uh, actually you know, uh, 
uh, get their, the drugs out into the market. We have sci folks working for the World Health Organization, uh, development agencies, um, doing cross-cultural training, working for the New York City Parks Department, trying to figure out what the best design of parks is for the communities that move in. So anthropologists, uh, the, an anthropological perspective on the world and the set of tools that an anthropologist develops in terms of listening, understanding power structure, seeing how cultural patterns get formed. Uh, those are the kinds of skills that can be employed in any group setting to take you beyond the surface to something deeper and more uh, more meaningful. And just like physical anthropologists, you also do field work, like the one you described in China a few minutes ago. Sure. I mean, in some, some ways, field work is the essential training ground for anthropologists, for cultural anthropologists. It's where we develop our basic skill sets and um, and it's it's sort of one of those things that when you get together with a other anthropologists, you talk about your field work because it's it's our connection to one another, re even if we've done it in different parts of the world. So um, the key to field work is that it's about learning. It's about crossing cultural barriers and boundaries, uh, going someplace you've never been before. Um, and even if it's someplace you've been before, seeing it in a way you've never seen it before. So that field work process of taking your body and moving it into a new and uncomfortable environment is a dramatic new framework for learning. And so um, uh, I, I try to offer my students here at Baruch field work opportunities in every class because I think it's that embodied experience of field work that is transformative for anthropologists. It reshapes who we are, the way we see the world. The other thing that a, a lot of people don't realize is that anthropologists in general and cultural anthropologists in particular have a very s strict set of rules mm. on how to conduct their research because we are dealing with other human beings. Sure. And can you explain some of the intricacies of, of doing that and why you have, you have to be so careful? Right. Well, we have a, a very um, developed set of uh, ethical guidelines for doing our work. Um, we're very concerned about our human subjects. And... Um, in some ways, it seems like common sense, uh, some of these guidelines, but it's important to have them carefully articulated. One is that, I think as in any human interaction, there should be informed consent. Uh, people should know what you're doing and should be and uh, should agree to participate. Uh, so being in the field, you want to let people know what you're doing as you're doing your research and give them a chance to participate or not. That's a fundamental s a part piece of our, our ethical code. And, and, they, um, and to be frank, they're having also some people who have abuse. Uh, for example, the interaction particularly with uh, a group of people who have never had contact with mm -hmm. Westerners, so to mm -hmm. speak. And because of that, there have been some big controversies in the, in the field of cultural anthropology for people who are basically have crossed the line. Yes, absolutely. And uh, this is something we're looking at all the time. Uh, certainly there have been... Um, uh, uh, you know, a breakage of our ethical standards in relationship to indigenous people. Uh, more, uh, another recent uh, example is with uh, what are called human terrain systems. Uh, these are efforts by um, the U.S. military to recruit anthropologists into frontline war situations with the idea that if you can have a cultural anthropologist help you um, navigate a new and cross-cultural environment in Iraq or Afghanistan, then you're more likely as the military to be able to do your job well. And of course, uh, the pay is great, um, but the ethical quandary is, of course, that um, if the military doing its job well means knowing which members of the community are the most effective leaders and uh, should be most um, clearly targeted by the mili military to be taken out. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not really something that our anthropological ethical standards supports. Uh, reading your, your resume, I saw the title of, of a book that you wrote, mm. which is God in Chinatown, mm. which I found fascinating title. Can you tell our audience about what's, what is in that book? What is that book all about? God in Chinatown is um, my attempt to understand a recent wave of, of Chinese immigrants from Southeast China through the lens of their immigrant religious communities. And um, I had the opportunity as part of my 
dissertation research, but also uh, I, I continue to do this work to um, uh, do field work in religious communities here in Chinatown. Uh, and then that, re- that research has taken me back to China as well, as I've tried to figure out why so many hundreds of thousands of immigrants are leaving poor villages uh, in Southeast China and coming to New York. Um, and uh, I've had to go back to China to try to understand that. But uh, as an anthropologist, you're, we're always looking for ways of entering a community. And um, uh, my experience of doing my, uh, my mapping and my field work was that I encountered a number of religious communities that were very vibrant, that were starting from scratch, uh, and that were also very open to... Um, uh, to talking to me about what their lives were. And so it was through that lens that I began to understand this massive wave of undocumented immigrants, the whole human smuggling network uh, that had been built up to move them into New York. Uh, it's through them, through the religious communities, that I began to see the circulation of people uh, from New York out as in, uh, across the country as new immigrants were beginning to set up restaurants in New Jersey and Connecticut and now as far as you know Texas, Florida and Wisconsin. So the religious communities um, both Protestant, Catholic, Buddhist and Taoist um, that I studied gave me uh, an opportunity to see people as they organized themselves and pulled together their social capital, their financial capital, to try to survive Mm -hmm. in the United States, and also as they really developed strategies for thriving. Although most Americans have a vague idea of how the Chinese immigration happened Mm. in the West, with people working their railroads almost a, a, almost as a slave practically, mm-hmm. and then they incorporate into society. I don't think there is a very clear picture of how the Chinese immigration in New York City evolved. Can you explain that to our audience, please? The um, the first records we have of Chinese immigrants here in New York City are from the late 1700s, actually. Uh, sailors who came on clipper ships that were running between New York and South China. Mm-hmm. Um, people who uh, came on board as sailors and as chefs and when they came to New York then they they got off but the Chinese community uh, really didn't expand until the middle of the 1800s uh, when the Transcontinental Railroad uh, uh, was opened and more Chinese workers were brought by um, by uh, factory owners across the country to work <coughs> in low-wage jobs at lower wages than the uh, European immigrants <coughs> and uh, African Americans were willing to even work. So they were immediately thrust into contentious labor battles. Uh, Chinatown emerged here in, Ch- in New York City as a safe haven, as an ethnic enclave where people could, uh, could live and work, uh, could open small businesses, could mobilize the financial and social capital they needed to survive and, and, and take care of each other. Um, and it was a very small community, really, until the 1960s. And uh, with immigration law changes, it grew. Um, <coughs> and then in the 1980s, we began to see a large new wave of immigrants that were coming um, from southeast China, this area called Fuzhou, um, facilitated by a vast smuggling n- industry, human smuggling industry, yeah. that's uh, now brought probably three or four, maybe 500,000 Chinese immigrants through New York. Uh, many of them are still here. It's the, fa- it's the largest growing immigrant population uh, in New York City and, um, uh, and also spreading around the country. What has been the role played by Chinese immigrants in, this, in, the, in, in the life of New York City? Hmm. Well, um, hmm, it's interesting to, uh, to think about that over time. Um, small businesses, entrepreneurs. Um, when I first came to New York in the 1980s, all the laundries in my neighborhood were Chinese laundries. Um, but n- since the 80s, there's been a massive expansion of Chinese restaurants, little takeout restaurants, all-you-can-eat buffets around the country. Um, so um, at least the population that I'm thinking about and working with in, in terms of Chinese immigrants who are labor immigrants, uh, working poor, um, they they had a dramatic impact on um, 
uh, on on the restaurant trade, not just Chinese, but Japanese and Vietnamese restaurants. The other piece I would say is that the Chinese have been significant in rejuvenating old immigrant neighborhoods. So Chinatown and the Lower East Side uh, was rejuvenated by this huge wave of immigrants coming in the 1980s. It was not a place people wanted to live in the 1980s. But now the contestation and battle over the Lower East Side and Chinatown between real estate developers and immigrant entrepreneurs is at a fevered pitch. Um, it's a de very desirable location. The same thing has happened in all throughout Brooklyn. Uh, Sunset Park, all the way out to Sheepshead Bay. Uh, these are n old immigrant neighborhoods that were settled by European immigrants in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, ha uh, saw a decline as the city went through a period of deindustrialization, and new immigrants have rejuvenated them uh, as they brought their small uh, business and entrepreneurial spirit into them. And now they become more and more... Um, they become more and more attractive, and uh, there's this pitched battle over whose communities they're going to be in the future. Since you mentioned that the big wave of Chinese immigration into New York City really happened in the 1980s, and given the history in this country of having a lot of racism mm. regarding people who come from elsewhere, do you think that the Chinese who came to New York we know it, ha it happened in the West Coast, but to came to New York because of the time they came, did they suffer the same kind of racism that all other immigrant groups have suffered in the history of this country? Um, yes, I think there's. Uh, we have a long history of, of uh, exclusion uh, that's confronted Chinese not only in California but across the country. Uh, federal exclusion acts and laws that discriminated against them uh, created communities that were almost exclusively male, uh, that felt uh, like they were sojourners uh, without permanent location. So um, Chinatowns originally emerged as places of safety uh, where, where Chinese could uh, be um, protected from this kind of anti-immigrant nativism. And um, I think that Chinatown, uh, New York, has, um, uh, it's, it's uh, almost been ignored by the city uh, in terms of it, the I infrastructure and um, uh, engagement of, of city, state, and federal authorities. There's a kind of racism there of the exotic other mm -hmm. of uh, of of the impressions of of drugs and gangs and some strange place where oh, tourists will want to go there to have meals but not after dark. Uh, there's been a way in which that exoticization of yeah. Chinatown has, I think, been deeply part of the uh, dynamics of race and racism in this country. Now, we have been using the term Chinese, mm. but the fact of the matter is this is a very heterogeneous group. Sure. Uh, sometimes they speak different languages, mm -hmm. Mandarin, Cantonese, mm -hmm. and others. But uh, also they have different religious affiliations, mm -hmm. Christians, Buddhism, Taoism. But also they segregate themselves according to the geographic region they are coming from in China. And do you think that makes that community more difficult to be united versus certain type of injustices or certain issues that they need to work together in order to achieve certain progress? Yes, it, it's, a, it's really an important uh, piece of uh, awareness about Chinese that they're not all the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's something we deal with here at Baruch College as we think about our Chinese population. They come from different parts of China. They are part of different immigrant waves. They're different generations. Um, they have different um, primary, secondary, and tertiary languages that they use at home. So um, uh, it certainly has been a, um, a, a challenge within the Chinese community uh, to bridge those barriers. Uh, and we're, we've seen over the last 25 or 30 years a dramatic transformation of Manhattan's Chinatown and New York's Chinese population as uh, what had been primarily Cantonese-speaking immigrants uh, for the first 125 years of, of immigration into New York City uh, has been gradually um, 
not really replaced, but uh, it's been added to and uh, in some ways supplanted as the majority population by a group from Fuzhou. And that's, um, they have their own dialect. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a Fuzhou Hua, Fuzhou dialect. So Mandarin for them is a second dialect. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Cantonese and Fujonese are mutually unintelligible as dialects. Yeah. And um, actually Mandarin has become a, a common language that they've, that people are are using in Chinatown to communicate with one another. Because also the, the official language in China. It is, yeah. and um, if you go to school in China, it's the language of instruction. Exactly. It's the official language and of media yeah. and and, uh, and and the press. So. How about the relations between the Chinese immigrants in New York and other groups of immigrants? Mm-hmm. Have there been always harmonious or there have been some competition? Because you mentioned earlier that the Chinese are replaced in certain ways some previous immigrants in certain parts of the city. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems to me the part of our, um, uh, the uh, uh, unfortunate part of our American tradition of, of established immigrants being anxious about Mo- the more recent immigrants that they are going to take their jobs. We've certainly heard a lot of that in the recent political campaign. But as a scholar of immigration and the students of in the American immigration history, the, those narratives are not new at all. Um, and so, yes, there are, there are tensions that occur. Um, one of the interesting things, one, groups that I've been Uh, spending some time with and taking my students to visit with is called the Chinese Staff and Workers Association in Manhattan's Chinatown. And um, they're very active in trying to create a multi-ethnic coalition uh, on the Lower East Side to resist a lot of the gentrification that's being pushed by city policies. And uh, it's a very, uh, it's a fascinating experience uh, for them. And it's fascinating to watch as they successfully reach out to a very large Puerto Rican population and, um, and African American population um, and try to build a, a coalition around issues of class and inequality. Mm. Okay. Well, my last question for you is, uh, I've been explaining all that you have been doing all these years. What is your next big project? Mm. Well, um, I have one uh, big ongoing project, which is uh, that I've I've been trying to take what I have developed in my classroom here at Baruch and make it available to students across the country. So I have a, a, a set of textbooks that I've developed um, that and, take, and tries to take... Uh, and this one of them, right? Uh, there we go, cultural anthropology. It tries to uh, ex- show that cultural anthropology is a toolkit for a global age mm-hmm. and... Um, So that's uh, a big project, and I feel we've been very successful in reshaping the way anthropology is being taught across the country, and uh, so that's important. Um, uh, My next uh, big project is actually focused on um, uh, intersection of anthropology and uh, religion and memoir and maybe a little ethno-history. It's it's a, a book about my grandfather's wallet. Uh-huh. And uh, my grandfather, my and uh, my grandparents were missionaries in India uh, in the 1920s and early 30s, and then in Manila from 1935 to 45. And the last three and a half years, they were in Manila. They were in, interned in a Japanese prison camp, and uh, with my mother, who was from 17 to 20 years old at the time. And um, my grandfather was the head of the large Protestant church in Manila and uh, organized religious activities and many other fascinating projects he had inside the internment camp. Um, He was actually killed in the rescue. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but his wallet was retrieved and has been passed along in the family. And so uh, I recently uh, uncovered the wallet and um, have been op- we we've opened it and begun to see all the things he carried for three and a half years in the prison camp, and it's given us a chance to explore. Uh, it's giving me a chance to explore all the different streams of his life that came into play in Manila. Well, let's do something when the book is published. I'll invite you again to the show so we can talk about that. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to Dr. Ken Guest about this interesting conversation about Chinese immigration in New York City. And next week, we're going to have Dr. Shelley Eversley of the Department of English, who will be talking about sex, race in America. So stay tuned. 
This has been College Talk with Dean Aldemaro Romero, Jr., a production of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College. All rights reserved, 2017.